main reason we meditate is so that we can see what we're doing. The mind is doing things all the time, and for the most part we're pretty oblivious to what it's doing. We fashion whole worlds in the mind. Instead of looking at the process of fashioning, we look at the world that we've created. We get lost in the world that we created. One world wears out, and then we get lost in another world. You could say one of the purposes of meditation is not to get lost. And the way to do that is to look instead of at the world, is to look at the way it's fashioned. This is one of the areas where the Buddhist teachings is really radical. You look at the teachings that were offered at his time, and a lot of it had to do with defining what is a person, who are you, what is your real self, on the one hand, and the other is what is the world. Is it something eternal? Is it something not? Is it finite? Is it infinite? In other words, the questions are about what things are. And the Buddha came along and said, those are all the wrong questions. The right question to ask is, what are you doing? In particular, what are you doing that's causing suffering? What could you do to stop that suffering? And so all of his really basic teachings have to do with action. I mean, that's why karma is such an important teaching. Because it points to your attention, intentions, and your intentions are shaped by your views. And if your views are concerned with what you are or what the world is, you're going to be sloppy in your actions. But if your views deal with what are you doing? What kind of actions are skillful? What kind of actions are not skillful? That focuses your attention where it really can make a difference, where it really can be of use. And then the rest of the path follows on that. You make up your mind that you're going to act on intentions that are not harmful. And you apply that principle to your daily life in what you do, what you say, how you earn your livelihood. And then you've got to put the mind in a position where it really can read itself. It can see what it's doing very clearly. That's where we have the path factors of right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. In terms of right effort, you try to generate desire and stay firm in your intent to abandon what's unskillful and to develop what's skillful. And you try to keep that in mind. And as you keep that in mind, you find that the mind is ultimately able to settle down. The Buddha talks about this in one of his discourses that he actually got on the right path when he started dividing his thoughts into two types, those that were harmful and those that weren't. And again, he looked at the thoughts not as, or not in terms of their content, but in terms of what they did as a pattern of cause and effect. And he found that thoughts that were imbued with sensuality, imbued with ill will, or violence and cruelty were harmful, and those that were devoid of these qualities were harmless. So he made up his mind. Every time his mind started heading off into unskillful thought patterns, he would pull it back, like a cowherd. You see the cows wandering off into the rice fields, or you beat them back to keep out of the rice. And he Notice if his thoughts were going in harmless directions, he allowed them to wander at will, simply being aware that they were there, in case they might start getting into trouble again. 
But he found that even thinking harmless thoughts was burdensome to the mind. If you thought for 24 hours in harmless ways, you could wear your mind down. So that's how he induced his mind to concentration. It was an even more restful state that caused even less harm, less wear on himself and on other people. And at the same time, when the mind is concentrated, you can see yourself really clearly, see the actions of the mind very clearly, because you give yourself a good reference point. The reference points could be the body, feelings, mind states themselves, or individual mental qualities. But we start with the body. This is why we focus on the breath, because of the different aspects of the body, the breath is closest to the mind. It's most sensitive to the movements of the mind, and it itself exerts a positive or a negative influence on the mind. So it's a good part of the body to know. Try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, so you sense the whole process of breathing. We're not focused simply on the air coming in and out of the lungs, but on the whole process of how the body maintains itself through breathing, how the different parts of the body are involved or are not involved in the process of breathing. And as you explore in this area, you find that you're learning not only about the breath, but also about the body, the body as a whole and the mind, because this is where the body and the mind all come together. You're putting yourself in a really good place to observe the mind. And as you observe it, you find that you can also train it in various directions. So its intentions and views become more and more skillful. Because the way we cause suffering is through our intentions, but also the path to the end of suffering is also a marshalling of our intentions to direct them in the right direction. So that's what we're doing here right now, learning to watch the mind as it acts, and basically watch the actions of the mind. It's The mind in and of itself is something hard to observe straight on, but we get to know it through its actions. We train it through training its actions. This is why we depend on a tradition, so we don't have to reinvent the Dharma wheel every time we sit down. Because left to our own devices, we might not be able to live to the point where we've figured out what really is skillful and what's not. So we look on the skills that people of the past have worked on. We learn from their experience. And in some cases we have to relearn things from within, but it's really useful to have pointers from the past to give us a leg up. It's like learning a musical instrument. It really helps to know something about music theory. It helps to hear recordings of masters of the past. So you can get an idea of which areas of action are fruitful to explore. Of course, if you simply imitate them, it becomes a rote process. Which is a skill of one kind. But it's also possible to learn from the past and then develop it explore areas that are not explained in the text. And the Buddha seems to anticipate this in his meditation instructions. He doesn't set everything out in sort of nice step-by-step -step form that even brainless people can follow. He su plants suggestions in our minds, points, points out areas where it's fruitful to explore, and then leaves it up to our own ingenuity to continue the exploration. He wants to make us curious, so that we follow our curiosity. 
if meditation were simply a matter of following pre preset steps, it would get very dull and very confining very quickly. But it doesn't hurt that we have recommendations to where it's useful to look, what skills are useful to develop. This is why the concept of beginner's mind is vastly overrated. They said there are lots of potentials in the beginner's mind, mostly potentials that are not fulfilled, that are not actualized. They say the expert's mind has few possibilities. Well, that's, that's the wrong kind of expert. It's a dumb expert, someone who's mastered a, a craft but maybe hasn't developed it into an art. The artist, the master artist, is the one who's learned the craft but then keeps pushing the envelope. And those are the people who create the great works of art. Who can build on past experience and then push the envelope even further. So what you're trying to develop here is an expert mind. The mind that's expert at reading its own actions, figuring out what's skillful and what's not. And concentration is a huge help in that direction. It helps put the mind in a place where it can really see clearly what's going on. So when you hear about skillful behavior, it's not something you've simply heard in a Dharma talk or read in a book. You've seen for yourself that this kind of behavior really does lead to a sense of pleasure, a sense of well-being. And exploring that issue for yourself, you gain a lot in terms of discernment as well. Again, not simply by memorizing what's in books, but then at the same time not just kind of making wild steps without any sense of background or help for anybody else at all. It's learning how to use the lessons from the past and then apply them in a sensitive way to the present moment. That's expert mind. An expert mind has lots of possibilities, and many of them can actually be actualized. So learn from the past and explore the present. That's how awakening is found.